Hello there, ATS 571 students. This is the much promised lecture about the thermal wind. It's actually lecture 20 this semester, and it is the seventh lecture of our chapter three. And we're only going to make it through a couple pages of your textbook, but that's okay because this is very important material and we need to spend some time on it. Now, your textbook tries very hard to come out with guns blazing right there at the very beginning of this uh, section 3.4. And it says, if I'll just go ahead and quote your book, the geostrophic wind must have vertical shear in the presence of a horizontal temperature gradient. Okay, I, I think that's interesting that they say that right off the bat. Instead of then, you know, then they go back and show us why it would have to be. And then he says, as can be shown easily from simple physical considerations based on hydrostatic equilibrium. Well, I think I would object maybe to this word easily, but that's what we're going to be showing here. We're going to be learning about how the geostrophic wind must have vertical wind shear in the presence of horizontal temperature gradients. Another way to think about it is the other way around. If there's horizontal temperature gradients, there must be a, a wind shear to the geostrophic wind. And to show what we're talking about before we get just too far in any of these derivations or anything, um, let's take a look at this sort of map here. I've just kind of got a perspective map plot here. Don't worry about the fronts or anything right now. I just wanted you to understand we're kind of looking at a 3D depiction of the atmosphere here. And if I were to just sort of overlay onto here like a temperature gradient, just sort of by making part of the map blue and then transitioning to part of the map being red. Again, that doesn't make any sense with the fronts on there. I'm just trying to kind of give you a sense of 3D on here. Um, if I had that, then I could pick like three locations on this plot here and give you like little balloon launches or whatever at three locations here that I marked sort of with green circles. And... I have those arrows just showing like what the winds would be like at each of those locations here. And what I want to do is show you that up here with in the uh, first location that I'm circling here, where there's no temperature gradient, it's all just blue at the surface down there for all this cold air. Notice how the winds with respect to height are not really changing. They're all about the same direction and so on. And in the same way over here in this sort of warm air mass that I have, I have drawn uh, it so that the winds are not changing with respect to height either. As we launched this balloon at different heights, it was finding the same wind. On the other hand, right there on the temperature gradient, we are seeing that the winds are changing with respect to height. In practice, they are increasing with respect to height here, uh, but there are going to turn out to be other possibilities as well. So this is what we're talking about here. If those black arrows on there were supposed to be geostrophic winds, and we can argue whether that's a good idea or a bad idea, but if we say those are geostrophic winds, then see how those geostrophic winds are changing with respect to height? Our book comes out guns blazing and says that can only happen in the presence of a temperature gradient. So we're going to have to figure out exactly why that would be and so on. Now, the, that isn't the only way that the geostrophic wind could be changing with respect to height. Uh, it, you know, like in the previous slide, all that was happening was that the winds were becoming faster with respect to height. But in practice, this is a perfectly valid solution as well, where like maybe the winds are changing direction with respect to heights. And in fact, that'll be a perfectly normal thing too. Again, keeping in mind that this, strictly speaking, is VG, the geostrophic wind, not necessarily the real wind. But of course, once you get away from the boundary layer in the atmosphere, the geostrophic wind becomes a very good approximation to what the wind is doing. I mean, it would even be better if we could do this with gradient wind. But this will be a reasonably good approximation to what the winds are really doing. Now, I often come down a little bit hard on the textbook uh, as not being necessarily very well oriented around teaching students. Uh, but I think in this case, they do actually a fairly good job illustrating what this wind shear looks like when we're talking about just a change in the wind speed. Uh, this is an actual figure from your textbook I scanned in. It's page 81. And as long as you have a little explanation as to what this figure is doing, it's actually not terrible. Uh, if we just pick one isobaric surface, okay, so see how we got a coordinate system here. We got X, we got Y, we got Z. And we are looking at an isobaric surface there that I've highlighted in red, where we're at that pressure P naught plus delta P. I didn't use the very bottom one. I just worked on the middle one. And um, so we're trying to look at this with a perspective here. The part that's darker red is closer to us, and the part that fades to pink and white is uh, farther away from us. And we're just trying to look at this at a perspective. Now, this diagram um, shows it as if that's the x-axis moving off to the right, 
and that is a fairly standard way of looking at such things. On the other hand, it doesn't make a huge amount of sense in terms of the meteorology of this. Um, if you're already thinking, why would the height surfaces be closer to the ground? Why would an isobaric surface be closer to the ground in the west and farther from the ground in the east? Wouldn't it have been better if like they had drawn the perspective differently so that the height surface was closer to the, I'm sorry, the isobaric surface was closer to the ground in the no north and farther from the ground in the south? Yes, I wholeheartedly agree. Again, a good example of this not being necessarily a book very well oriented at all around teaching dynamic meteorology, but that's neither here nor there. All right, we have a given little isobaric surface there, and what the book is trying to help us see is this uh, geostrophic wind vector. Now, I highlighted it in red on our red surface there. So we have a geostrophic wind vector right now that is in that direction. It's headed off like parallel to the y-axis in this case. Okay, I could picture we might have a, uh, a geostrophic wind at some, uh, you know, maybe this is the... Um, Oh, let's say this is the 850 millibar surface that we're looking at right now here in red. I could picture that being the uh, a, a 850 millibar geostrophic wind heading straight to the north or something like that. Okay, I could see that. And how we would come up with that direction for the geostrophic wind would have to do with the space, the orientation of the height contours, which I have drawn in there as those red lines. Uh, the geostrophic wind will be parallel to them, and the magnitude of the geostrophic wind will have to do with how far apart those height contours are. Notice that those height contours there are nice little examples of level curves. That's just borrowing a term from calculus or whatever. I'm just trying to show you here that you know each of those contour, those red lines I drew on there, is like where a particular height above the ground on the z-axis slices through our isobaric surface there. Uh, anyway, so okay, so we have some height contours on this map and on the red level there. Okay, let's call that maybe 850 millibars. Now we could pick another isobaric level and I'll color it here blue. Maybe that blue one is 500 millibars. It's someplace higher above the ground anyway than that red level was. Uh, your book shows it as being P naught plus two delta P, um, where delta P is apparently a negative number, but whatever, they, they never return to that notation in this book, so it doesn't really matter. Anyway, so here's a new surface that I've got up there in blue. Again, it's kind of hard to see because the perspective is a little bit um, artificial. We're, it's vanishing off into the distance, though. The parts that are darker blue are closer to us, and the parts that get lighter blue and then fade off into white are farther away from us on that surface. And if that geostrophic wind vector that I have on there, uh, which I highlighted in blue, is going to be stronger than the one that was at a lower level, which, you know, again, they just illustrated with a smaller, shorter vector. Okay, I can I can picture this here. Again, let's think that that is like maybe a 500 millibar surface that I have there in blue, and I'm then in that case, the 500 millibar geostrophic wind at that location is still straight, you know, out of the south and heading towards the north. It's just going to be a stronger wind. Okay, I can see that, and I can wonder how we're going to get that. Well, the direction, of course, is going to have to do with the orientation of the height contours on that 500 millibar surface, which I've drawn some of them there as those solid blue lines. But in order to make the wind speed stronger, the only thing that determined the speed of the geostrophic wind was the spacing of the height contours themselves. So if the wind at 500 millibars, is, if the geostrophic wind, that is, at 500 millibars is going to be stronger, we're going to have to have those height contours closer together than they were at the red level. So see how at the red level, those contours were fairly far apart. And then on the uh, the green, uh, the blue level rather, they're fairly close together. In order to get that stronger wind speed for the geostrophic wind at the blue level, we're going to have to have the height contours closer together. We're going to have to have a more of a slope to our isobaric surface. Now, this is where the book starts making some of the, the notation a little bit more clear. See how there is a distance between each of these two surfaces, the red one and the blue one. Maybe that's 850 and 500 millibars or something like that. And the distance between those surfaces, the book is using this notation delta Z, where that little delta Z is just going to be a measure of literally how many meters it is between those two uh, isobaric surfaces. Now, if that delta Z were a constant, then the spacing between that red and that blue isobaric surface really wouldn't be changing. It would uh, not changing with respect to time, but changing from location to location. The two surfaces would basically be parallel to each other. 
that would mean that the height gradient would be exactly the same on the two surfaces because if whatever whatever was doing on one surface, the other surface is parallel to it, it's going to have the same slope as the first surface did. And well, if the slope of that isobaric surface or is what determines the speed of the geostrophic wind, the geostrophic wind would be the same on both of those two surfaces too if they were evenly spaced, if that delta z was a constant. But delta z is clearly not a constant here. It clearly, in this case, is varying with respect to x. And again, just to make that a little bit more clear, this is the x-axis here along this way. And so at two different locations along the x-axis, like in this case, this x1, we have one value of delta z, delta z1, whereas at a different location along the x-axis, x2, we have a different value, delta z2. That is, so the distance between the red isobaric surface and the blue isobaric surface is changing as a function of x. Okay. So then we should definitely be asking ourselves, what is this delta z? What is this distance between the two isobaric surfaces? And of course, it's no huge surprise to students in a class like this that that is thickness. Thickness is the term that meteorologists use to describe the distance in meters between two isobaric levels. And your book throws out this uh, equation that is actually uh, related to the hypsometric equation we had back earlier in the semester, where it's basically saying that the thickness of this layer is going to be related to gravitation, the ideal gas constant, the pressure that we're on, and temperature. But in this context where we're working on an isobaric surface, actually, um, if we just took that to be like the mean temperature of a layer, delta, uh, that T, then all those other terms are constants. And gravitation is constant, gas constant is a constant, the pressure will be, this is the pressure on these isobaric surfaces. Only that mean temperature of the layer will be not a constant. And so for a given layer, everything on the right-hand side is a constant except the temperature. So horizontal changes in thickness will end up depending only on horizontal changes in temperature. In other words, if we could take the partial derivative there of the of the left-hand side, like if I could actually go over here and say like partial partial x of the left-hand side of this equation, well, I could do this, I'd have to do of course the same thing on the right-hand side, but everything on the right-hand side is a constant except t, uh, t. So I could group everything outside of there, you know, I'd have my g and my r, or sorry, it's g to the one, it's a one over g, uh, and my r, and, and I'd have that, that differential of log p, but the only thing that would be inside of my partial, partial x would be that temperature. I'd only have a partial t, partial x term there. Everything else would be constants for this equation. So what we're saying is that changes in the geostrophic wind with respect to height, namely partial vg, partial z, depend only on the temperature gradient t. Now, if I were remaking these slides from scratch here, I would say, well, you know, I might cross that z out and make a change with respect to pressure. And in fact, if I were really being strict about it, I'd probably want to make this actually with respect to the log of pressure. But we're going to see that, I mean, those are just changes of coordinates and so on. We could make it work in any of those forms. So let's think about what it would take to actually derive this relationship between temperature gradient and thickness and geostrophic wind. Well, if we're going to be talking about the rate of change of the geostrophic wind in the vertical direction, we're probably going to need to start with expressions for the geostrophic wind itself which I just took from an earlier chapter. You've memorized these definitions already for the zonal and meridional components of the geostrophic wind. So, and notice I have them just in forms of the geopotential on the right-hand side. All right, now another form that we're gonna be working with here, uh, it can be shown that for, through the ideal gas law and hydrostatic balance that this identity here is true, that partial, the part here that's relevant to what we're gonna be doing right now is the part on the far left here. Uh, this change, we're going to keep seeing terms that have this partial phi, partial p, or this change in geopotential with respect to pressure, and we're going to make this substitution, okay? So you're going to see this a couple times in the, I think twice actually in the next uh, couple slides here for their derivation. Now what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, it says take the derive, take the derivative of these terms right here and with respect to p, and then we're going to see if we can make some substitutions to get this in terms of change in the, uh, the geostrophic wind with respect to height. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with the geostrophic wind in the zonal direction. And we're going to just uh, take the derivative of both sides with respect to pressure. So you can see on both sides I took partial, partial P. 
Now on the right hand side over there, we can actually change the order of these derivatives. You can almost always do that where you change from like partial partial p of partial partial y. You can almost always change them around. In fact, I think you maybe always can as long as it's a well behaved field. You can change it to partial partial y partial partial p just changing the order of those derivatives. And then we do that substitution that I mentioned a few slides ago, but take that partial fee partial p and put in there negative rt over p. That's pretty straightforward. I hate equations that have a negative of a negative in there. Let's go ahead and cancel those negatives out right away. That just seems like the simpler. Now I take this equation here that's at the bottom of the slide. And I'm just going to move it up to the top because uh, I couldn't get this all on at one time. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take the terms out of that partial derivative that are constants. R is, that, is the gas constant. That's no problem. And now P, because we're working on an isobaric surfaces, is a constant. So that can come out of the derivative too. And we just are left with partial T, partial Y. Now we can move that P to the left-hand side of the equation by multiplying through by P. And then there's a little substitution here that comes to us from calculus um, where you could like take P over partial P becomes 1 over partial log P. Whether that's something you keep on the tip of your tongue or not is not terribly important. But hold that thought. We now have a form of the equation here that has the change of the geostrophic winds U component with respect to height, well, log P is a bunch of stuff on the on the right hand side that's pretty straightforward. Hold that thought. Let's do the same basic derivation except for the uh, meridional component of the wind. And I do see that I mis made a mistake here on that arrow there. It should say start with the geostrophic wind in the meridional direction. But we're going to do exactly the same steps here. We're going to take the derivative with respect to pressure. And then we're going to take uh, rearrange the orders of those derivatives on the right hand side. And then we're going to do that substitution that I mentioned earlier where we get rid of partial phi, partial p, and replace it with rt over p. And let's move that negative sign out in front. It's just, it's just a tidier equation. Now again, I'm going to take this equation that's at the bottom of the screen right here, and I'm just going to pull it up to the top of the screen to make more room. Okay, I'm going to move the things that are inside of that partial partial x that are constants. I'm going to move them out of the derivative, leaving me with just partial t partial x, the temperature uh, gradient in the x direction. And I'm going to move that p to the other side of the to the left hand side of the equation by multiplying by p. And then again, this is that same substitution from calculus where we took p over log uh, p over dp and changed that to one over uh, partial log p. That's just a little substitution from calc. If you don't remember it, it's not the end of the world. And we have another form of the equation here. And again, hold this equation in, in your mind because we've got a change in the geostrophic wind with respect to pressure. So we could take these two equations of, that we've now derived, and one's a, a u component and one's a v component. We can combine them into a vector form that we might not love, but clearly the left-hand side is the change in the geostrophic wind vector with respect to something like height is equal to, and then a right-hand side that's a little ugly, but I mean, it's just got the gradient of temperature on one part. Uh, the little subscript P is, means that this is on an isobaric level, like maybe this is the temperature gradient at 850 millibars cross that you could think this all through with your right hand rule and from the book the book says this equation is often referred to as the thermal wind equation yay however it is actually a relationship for the vertical wind shear mm, that's not exactly what we were looking for the book says strictly speaking the term thermal wind refers to the vector difference between the geostrophic wind at two uh, isobaric levels so strictly speaking your geostrophic wind vt would be the difference between two geostrophic winds one at p1 and one at p0 where p1 is farther above the ground than p0 is. Now this is vector subtraction. I have to admit I always have, I find vector subtraction hard to think about. I think it's better to think about this in terms of um, vector addition. If we just rearrange this here, then we have the geostrophic wind at the lower level, p0, plus the thermal wind is equal to a new geostrophic wind at some higher level above the ground. So even though people tend to call this the thermal wind equation, it's more accurate to say that this form it is, but once you actually, um, you can kind of see that, well, this term in here is basically just the integral of this form right here. I mean, the t one form is basically the integral of another. Strictly speaking, uh, this lower one is what's the thermal wind equation, but, uh, you know, that's splitting hairs a little bit. Working with that form of the thermal wind equation can be tricky because you got to know what you're going to do with temperature. Uh, if you could say the temperature was constant in your layer, you'd have no real problem. Uh, if you wanted to say that you had like an average temperature or a mean temperature for the layer between P0 and P1, 
what you call that, uh, you could then substitute that in and you'd have a fairly straightforward way of working with this. But finding T, at that average T for the layer uh, is a mess. Um, on the other hand, thickness isn't really a problem at all. Thickness is easy to work with. Um, you know, like if you have weather balloon launches, you just find the height at which you went through one pressure level and you find the height you went through at the other pressure level and that distance between them is just the thickness, uh, geopotential one minus geopotential naught. So that's pretty straightforward. So, I mean, we can do some rearranging and find out that that ther thermal wind UT and VT is just equal to the height, the gradient rather of the thickness, right? That's the, the that phi naught and phi one, the distance between them is the thickness of those layers. In that is then the derivative of the thickness in the y direction and the derivative of the thickness in the x direction. That seems pretty straightforward. We should be able to learn more about this from maps of thickness. So since these changes in the geostrophic wind with respect to height are related to thickness, it seems like we should be able to learn about it by looking at maps of thickness. So let's do that. Here is an old school map. Difax map happens to be January 2004, but they still make these things. The solid contours on here are pressure at the surface. So we're looking at the patterns of like cyclones and anticyclones. And the dashed contours on here are contours of thickness. And let's just zoom in on North America here. And I'm looking at this pattern right here. And boy, there's a lot going on. These are a little hard to read, but let's, we'll work our way through it. And I'm gonna superimpose on here the equation that we're gonna be using for the thermal wind, UT and VT. And I'm gonna pick a point. I've got a point there in uh, Alabama that has uh, that little yellow circle on there. And I'm gonna use this map of the pressure at the surface and the 1,000 to 500 millibar thickness to tell me something about what's going on with the thermal wind. So let's actually take that point and make kind of a little big plus sign here. We're gonna talk about the point to the north, the point to the south, the point to the east, and the point to the west as our way of approximating these, fine, you know, making a finite difference approximation to these partial partial y and partial partial x terms. And if I think about the UT equation, okay, UT, thickness is decreasing to the north. If you look at these contours, as we go from the south side to the north side of the box, uh, uh, north south side to the north side of the plus sign or whatever, you can see that we are decreasing as we go to the north. So that partial thickness, partial Y term is going to be negative. But there's a negative sign in front of the whole thing. So your result is that UT, the thermal wind's zonal component, is going to be positive. It's gonna be from the west. On the other hand, at that particular location, let's look through VT. VT is, uh, we're going to be looking at the changes in thickness in the x direction. And if you take a look, it's basically constant at that location in the x direction. We're at basically the same contour on the east side and the west side of that plus, same, uh, plus uh, symbol there. So in this case, VT in the, on, at that location is zero. So, okay, if I wanted to actually draw what my thermal wind vector is gonna look like at that location, it looks like something like this. Here's big VT, the vector. All right, it's that orange vector that's on there. In fact, we could have done this at lots of locations on this map, and what we would have found is that our thermal wind vectors are parallel to contours of thickness. They have low thickness to their left and high thickness to their right, and they get longer and stronger the, cl the, the closer together the thickness contours get, the stronger the gradient gets. It works very much the same way like geostrophic wind works, except geostrophic wind uses height contours. Now we're using thickness, and this is the thermal wind that we're looking at right there. Now, let's think about what that actually means for our location there in uh, northern Alabama. Um, that location is on the east side of an anticyclone in this case, and I've just sort of drew a blue arrow there helping you realize which way the winds are rotating around there. Now, the winds are not geostrophic nor are they, for that matter, in gradient balance, because that is actually surface high, uh, pr surface pressure that's on there. But we can certainly compute a geostrophic, there's nothing that stops us from being able to compute a geostrophic wind at that location. It may not be what the real wind is doing, but it's always gonna be an approximation to what the real wind is doing. And at that location there, if I wanted to make some a geostrophic wind that, that is parallel to the isobars at the surface and so on, it probably would look something like that at that blue dot there. It would be parallel to the isobars at its location, um, all right, great. It's probably not a terrible approximation to what the real winds are doing, actually. Now, if I superimposed on that what the thermal wind vector looks like, and think about this as being, oh yeah, we have this way of thinking about it as um, a vector addition, where we take the geostrophic wind at the lower part of the level and add the thermal wind, we should get the geostrophic wind at the upper part of the level. 
So if blue is the geostrophic wind at near the surface or 1,000 millibars or something like that, then our add our thermal wind to that, a resulting vector is that green vector. That should be the geostrophic wind at the top of the layer, namely 500 millibars in this case. So that would be approximately what our geostrophic wind at 500 millibars would be doing. Maybe it's part of a ridge or something like that. Now, um, that is then being what's being created by the temperature. That is a change in the wind, geostrophic wind at different heights being caused by that temperature gradient here. And notice how the wind changed with respect to height. In this case, the wind was changing counterclockwise with respect to height. The winds down there near the surface that were in that blue are then, you know, as we go up with respect to height, the winds are rotating counterclockwise. There's a vocabulary word here, backing. Backing is when winds change counterclockwise with respect to height. And counterclockwise rotation with respect to height and backing is associated with cold air advection. Let's talk a little bit about cold air advection just for a second here. See how the wind at this location at the surface is blowing um, parallel to height contours or pressure contours in this case, and it is blowing across contours of thickness from cold towards warm air. Well, anytime you have a wind blowing across contours like that, you're going to be making these uh, little boxes, these little diamonds on here that are called solenoids. See how there's all these little diamonds on here? These little diamonds are called solenoids. Anytime you have a whole bunch of those little diamonds out there, you should be thinking about advection. Now, you're going to be watching a second whole video that's about finding temperature, finding advection on a weather map. If you aren't familiar with this technique, you will be finding, figuring out how to find advection on a map like this. But smaller little solenoids, those little diamonds, the smaller and smaller they get, the stronger and stronger the advection is getting. So this area that I have circled in blue, where we see the two sets of contours crossing and making those little diamonds, is an area of cold air advection. And throughout that area of cold air advection, the winds are backing. We could do a similar analysis for the wind, uh, the thermal wind at that location up there in um, Kansas, uh, right? Well, if we did it, we'd already find out though, because we don't need to work through all the signs and everything. We know that the thermal wind will be parallel to the contours of thickness. And we know that the wind at the surface is basically parallel to those isobars, if we're assuming that's the geostrophic wind anyway. Again, it's probably not, but it's probably not a terrible approximation to it. Well, once again, if we do our little vector addition trick where we're adding the thermal wind to the wind at the low level, the result will be our wind at the top of the layer, which in this case is 500 millibars. So our green vector there is the, the wind at the top, the geostrophic wind anyway, at the top of the layer. That's the 500 millibar geostrophic wind. Notice how the winds are changing with respect to height. This time as we went from the low level wind, which is blue, to the upper level wind, which is green, the winds are turning clockwise with respect to height, and that's called veering. Veering is always associated with warm air advection. So here's an area of warm air advection. Uh, again, it's, see how the two sets of contours are crossing each other and making little diamonds called solenoids? This is an area that we could identify as having warm air advection. And throughout that region, the winds are going to be veering. They're going to be turning clockwise with respect to height. How do you keep it straight? How do you remember which one is veering and which one is backing? Well, the names are kind of easy to keep straight. Backing is cold air advection and veering is warm air advection. Notice how B is right next to C in the alphabet. So backing, cold air advection. V and W are near each other in the alphabet. So veering, warm air advection. So that part is kind of easy to keep track of. It's keeping track of which one is clockwise and which one is counterclockwise that I have trouble with. Here's how I remember it. Let's go back to a diagram like this of a cyclone here, where we've got winds rotating around it, and on the east side of it, the winds are out of the south, and there's warm air advection happening, and on the, uh, on the west side of it, there is winds are out of the north, and there's going to be cold air advection happening. So you can see I've got these kind of surface winds drawn in here as a blue arrow and a red arrow. Well. Aloft, above this whole system, the winds are going to be more or less westerly. Okay, I mean, whether we're in a trough or a ridge, whether we're, whatever's going on, I mean, we're presumably in a trough, but whatever, the winds are going to be more westerly aloft. Uh, how do we get there? How do we get from at the surface having winds out of the south or out of the north to having winds aloft that are out of the west? Well, in the area of cold air advection, the winds are going to be turning counterclockwise with respect to height. See how the winds are like out of the north, at the surface, and then they become more out of the northwest, and then out of the north, uh, the west northwest, and then eventually out of the west northwest, and then almost, uh, and then by the time we get to the top, they're out of the west. 
the winds are turning counterclockwise with respect to height. On the other hand, uh, in the area of warm air advection, the winds are out of the south, uh, maybe they're out of the southeast even, and then south southwest, and then maybe southwest, and then maybe at another height, uh, west-southwest, and by the time we get to a higher height, the winds are basically out of the west. The winds are turning clockwise with respect to height. Okay. Now, after you've, now that you've watched this, I want you to go on, watch the, vi the video that's about how to find advection on a weather map, because I know that sometimes that's something students aren't familiar with already. And the link to do that is in blue line. All right. Please let me know if you have any questions. This has been Dr. John Schrage.